Welcome to Island Baptist Church's Bible Study in the Acts of Jesus, Lesson 2. Well, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, or whatever time you're watching this. This is our second installment of our study here in Acts, and we started that last week, just like I said. Because not only are we not going able to go to worship service, not able to go to Bible study, Sunday school, and so I just wanted to do this Bible study with us together, and it's kind of coming at you preachy, I know that, because there's not a way for us to really have a dialogue, and you know, um, I know there's some, there's some ways to make, do question and answer online, and I'm just not savvy enough, y'all, so I'm just going to let you have it the way I've got it here. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 1, and we only got to verse 1, we're going to be skipping down to verses uh, 9 through through 11 uh, this at this time, and so I would ask if you would if you have a Bible with you, find a Bible. If you don't, find a Bible. If you don't, uh, call one of us, and we'll bring you a Bible. We'll send you a Bible. We'll show you how to pick up one on your phone, iPad, computer. Uh, but we need Scripture. We need Scripture at all times in our lives. But all the more at a time like this, we need to know what the truth is. Um, we need direction, real direction. We need someone who is over and above and ahead all of this. And there's only one that has that, and that's God. And so we're going to him right now in prayer, and we're coming before him through his word, and we're trusting his Holy Spirit for, uh, for guidance. And so let's, let's lift our hearts to him right now. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are here with us. You've been here ahead of us, and you are beyond us, God. You see where we are today, and you see where we're headed. And, and so many of us, uh, all of us, are wondering what the future holds. Um, we're not sure, but we know that you hold the future, and so we're trusting you today, and we just want to confess our total reliance upon you, our heart heart and soul uh, trust in you. We want you to be the king. We want you to be exalted in our lives. We pray, God, that you would invade our minds and our thoughts and deliver us from um, unnecessary fear. We pray for protection for our congregation, uh, for their families, Lord. We pray for wisdom again in these times to know the kind of people we're supposed to be and we're trusting your indwelling spirit to lead us in that way. Thank you so much that we have a relationship with you. Thank you for loving us, God. We pray for all those who are listening, God. I don't even know where all they are, but I know that you know their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would touch them. I pray that you would move in them and through them. I pray that they would hear you, God, and know that you're the real God if they don't already know. Thank you for our time together. I pray you bless it. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So like I said last time, we started a series uh, in the book of Acts. And the key word in Acts is what we find there in the first verse is the word began. What Jesus began to do. So part one of Luke's writings is what we know of as the book of Luke. Part two of Luke's writings is, the, is what we call the book of Acts, and so what he begins the book of Acts by saying what Jesus began to do. So the inference here is that the book of Acts is what Jesus continues to do, and in fact, that's exactly what it is. What Jesus did in his physical body as he comes to seek and to save that which was lost, that's us, Lord. That's the ones who he, we needed him as Lord. We, we, we're uh, sinners. We're lost because of our sin. We're lost because, because sin has to be paid for, and either we're going to pay for it ourselves, which is going to take eternity, or we're going to take the eternal one's payment for us. He came to live only to die, to seek and to save that which was lost. He accomplished his mission. That's part one of what Luke writes here. He, he hangs himself on a cross. He allows himself to be killed. He raises himself from the dead only three days later. And um, to, to prove that he's the Savior, to prove that he's able to rescue us, I mean, out of, uh, of what good is a Savior who can't conquer death? And that's our problem. Is I don't have a problem with living. Um, I have a problem with dying. Uh, we're the, the, this book, though, as we saw here in Acts, is a test, uh, and it's a test of, of what we're supposed to be doing. And now that he's accomplished his mission uh, for us, now he's going to accomplish his mission through us. What Jesus began to do, he's now continuing to do, as it says here in the book of Acts, and we're the continuation uh, of that book. Uh, this book is a test of, the, of today's church. Uh, it's a standard of operation for us. Uh, it's a book of encouragement. It's a book of indictment on what we're doing. And so we really need to hear what this says. I, I, I don't know if you remember, uh, maybe you recognize this scene that's going to be on your screen there, I believe. This scene from ABC Wild World of Sports back in the 70s. It's a ski jumper. Uh, you may recognize it when I say the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. 
Uh, don't know if you remember this guy as he's coming down this uh, ski jump. He all of a sudden sits down. Uh, here he is, the next frame, uh, sitting down. He's coming down at incredible speeds. He's going to hit this ramp. Before he hits this ramp, he basically just sits back uh, for seemingly no apparent reason. And, of course, the next scene is, and I don't have it, but the next scene is, is him crashing off the end, and his goggles fly off, and it seems like he's super bad hurt, and he's the agony of defeat. And, and really, the, the real story is the guy wasn't a whole lot in agony. He basically came away with this uh, from this with uh, just a headache, and you can look up his story on the internet, but I'm going to tell you his, the rest of his story. Uh, his, his, uh, he was, like I said, effectively not injured. Uh, his interview later on told us that as he was coming down the hill, the reason why he did intentionally do this, he really meant to do this, he really meant to fall, he really meant to go down the slope, but he really meant to jump, but it turned out that he couldn't, and the reason why he couldn't is, is significant. So he meant to fall in the end because he wanted to stop himself. As he was going down the hill, here's the story, his story. So as he's headed down the hill, headed toward the jump, he realized he was going too fast. See, there, there is a speed, and, and there is a, uh, a distance they jump relative to speed, and so they're, they're coming down a slope like this, and they hit a ramp on the end, and based upon how hard they hit that ramp is how far out they jump. And he knew that uh, even though uh, you want to be the fastest among the group, of course, you jump out and then you land on a slope, and however far la down you land on that slope, wherever your skis touch, they mark that spot, and you're considered a, a ski jumper that way. But the problem about it is, is that that slope only has a certain distance, and then it flattens out. He realized coming down the, the ski ramp that he was going too fast, so what was going to happen is he was going to go off the end of that ramp, and he was going to go past the slope and just land on a flat place. So he was going to take a 300-foot jump and land on flat ground, not a good thing. Uh, whatever possible uh, damage he would have done to himself, which like I said, he didn't do much, uh, falling off the end of this ramp would be nothing compared to uh, falling 300 feet on the flat ground, which probably he would not have survived, uh, to be certain. And so uh, the fear of the slope, the fear of flying too high, uh, the fear of... Uh, the fall uh, led him to make the decisions that he lived. Literally, uh, fear led to his life, not to his death in this case. And we live in a day of a lot of fear. We've got a lot of fear happening around us. And, and there's certainly a reason to be uh, respectful of this virus and to be uh, mindful of it, but not to fear it. There's only one thing to fear, and that's the Lord of hosts. That's the God of heaven, the creator of the universe who holds all these things. Like I said, he's gone before us. So he knows exactly where we are, and, and we can trust him. Uh, we need to trust him. We need to place our faith in him. The fear of the Lord, like it says, is the beginning of wisdom, and the fear of the Lord is it turns us from uh, lots of snares, lots of problems. There are so many snares out there today, so many lies. We have to turn in that, that all fear of the Lord, all in awe of him, trusting him, that he's got everything in his hands and believing in him and, and uh, trusting that he's taking care of everything because he's gone before us through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, I don't know about you, but if I was picking a religion today, which of course I'm not, I would want one that spoke with clarity and authority about life beyond the grave. I mean, of what good is a religion that can't tell me really with authority what's going to happen after this life? I have to have something. I have to have something. Why, why should I listen to anyone whose religious leader is still dead? I, for instance, tell me, uh, and we've talked about this before, what, what is Confucius doing today? What is Mohammed doing today? What is Hare Krishna or, or, or D Joseph Smith doing today? These guys, they're all dead. They're all dead. If I was picking a religion, I would want one, because I don't have a problem with living. I have a problem with dying. So it, I don't want a leader, I don't want a savior that can't conquer death. God has sent his son Jesus Christ to conquer the thing that's conquering all of us, and he's done that already. In this world you will have trouble, he said, right? But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Christianity's faith, the faith Christianity is vastly different. Our founder, Jesus Christ, came to this world, became a man, died to pay for our sins, died to take my place and to take your place because we're sinners, crucified and killed, resurrected himself on the third day, 
And so that today we can know exactly what he's doing. You want to know what he's doing? Read the book of Acts. Watch the church today. That's what Jesus is doing. This is where he's going. This is the things that he's accomplishing. Our leader is alive and well. There was a florist in New York years ago who received a couple of orders one day uh, to put together some flower arrangements. Uh, one arrangement was for a law firm that had uh, moved locations. They had been in one small place and they had moved to a much lar larger building and so uh, they were to put together an arrangement for, for that occasion. And they also received this order for a large arrangement for a funeral. Uh, these, by the way, these flower arrangements were, looked basically the same. They were beautiful, they were expensive, they were large, and uh, so everything was going fine. They put the flowers together, they sent them off to their respective places. The problem with it was is that the cards got switched. So the card that was supposed to go to the lawyer went to the funeral. The one that was going to the funeral went to the lawyer. And so what happened was is the lawyer got a flower spray and the card said, uh, with our condolences, uh, even though they were moving to a new location. And the, the funeral <laughs> got this flower spray that says, uh, congratulations on your new location. And I guess, uh, you know, in some ways apropos, uh, but, but a new location is exactly what you're looking at here in the book of Acts as far as Jesus is concerned. Jesus is going to a new location. He's been on earth. He's been serving, he's been seeking and saving that which was lost. He gave his life to rescue us. He's resurrected and now he's moved to a new location. So we're gonna be taking a look uh, this morning, this evening, this afternoon, tonight, wherever you are, at uh, Jesus' ascension and its relevance for our lives. Take a look with me, Acts chapter one, verses nine through 11. Again, if you don't know, I am reading from the New American Standard. It's just my preferred text. I like a literal text and I like a readability and I got that in the book of and the, and the New American Standard, and so I recommend that one. If you don't have that one, it's fine. Uh, they read very much the same, but, but I just prefer this one. So verse 9 through 11, so he's been speaking to his disciples through verse 8. We're going to back up and look at those eight verses a little bit later next time, uh, but, but I wanted to move forward to the ascension uh, today. It says, after he had said these things, he that is Jesus was lifted up, literally off the ground, while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he goes, Phew, that way. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he, while he was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. All of a sudden, boom, these two guys appear in white clothes. And they said also, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come again just as in the same way as you've watched him go. So he's leaving with the clouds, he's coming with the clouds. Scripture's real clear on that. That's another issue. But right now we're going to talk about the leaving with the clouds and what does that mean? And so, like I said, we're going to take a close look at this ascension this, this morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, this ascension raises some big questions, and probably the biggest question is why? Why, why, why would he leave? Uh, um, why not stay? Uh, why, not, why, not, uh, why not stick around? Seems like this would be the place where, where he would want to be. I, I've got to do something here because I've made a mess of myself here. I've got to back out of my slides because I've lost my place. Come on. Started in the wrong spot, y'all. Started in the wrong spot. <laughs> there it is right there. Okay. So, so why would he leave? Seems like, seems like the best thing for Jesus to do would be to stay. I mean, it seems that way to me. I mean, what would he like to literally have Jesus in the flesh walking among us? I mean, we don't have to worry about following human beings and wondering whether they're telling the truth or not. Wouldn't it be awesome to have Jesus here with us? I mean, wouldn't it be awesome to have the same experience the disciples had? I mean, doesn't it sound great? Uh, how great would it be for the churches um, uh, seeing Jesus face to face, hearing him preach? Wow. Why leave? Why leave? Uh, unless, of course, his leaving was far better, and that's the, that's the way it is, far better for us than for him to stay. That may seem hard to imagine. I mean, what could be far better than 
uh, uh, having the presence of Jesus physically with us and being able to see him, being able to touch him, being able to hear him. Well, listen, his leaving, listen, his leaving was far better for us. We're going to get to that. But I want us just to consider something, because we always think of our, our side of things. We always think of uh, what it means for us. And sometimes we don't think of what, what his ascension or what anything, how it affects God and how it affects his son, Jesus. So let's first uh, consider what his ascension meant to heaven. We get a hint of this uh, from, from something Jesus says in his uh, high priestly prayer over here in John 17. You'll see it there on your screen, verses 4 and 5. This is the Son praying to the Father. He says, I have glorified you on earth, and I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Like I said, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He's about to be crucified. Now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, here it is, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Wow. Before there was anything. I was coexistent with you, co-eternal, of the same substance with the Father. This is Jesus, the everlasting one. What, what was it like before him? These were all the things that he laid aside to, to come here, to become one of us, to, to take our place. And so he's done that. Now he's going back to this incredible reception, this incredible uh, inauguration there in heaven. You can only imagine what it would have been like. And, and not only was a reception no doubt amazing, but it was what he brought with with him that was also amazing something that never happened before Ephesians hinted at here Ephesians 4 verse 8 notice what it says when he Jesus ascended on high there it is at his ascension he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men it's not altogether clear in this verse what it means but it is clear in other verses what it's talking about here is all the saints that passed away prior to Jesus death and resurrection and his ascension all these saints all these saints were kept captive, as it says there. They were captive in a place called paradise, but it was still captivity. It was still away from the presence of God. It still wasn't heaven. It certainly wasn't hell, but it wasn't heaven. They were kept captive there until the one who was to come would come and pay the price for their sins, just like he did. We, we look back at the death and the resurrection of Jesus in faith. They looked forward to the death and resurrection of Jesus in faith believing that their sins were going to be someday paid for. We look back knowing that they already have, and in both cases, because of the fact that he has both died and risen and ascended, we now go straight to be with him. So they went straight. Captivity became captive, and he took them all to heaven. The, the Davids, the Samuels, the, the Joshuas, the, the Moses, all these guys and gals that had been waiting on the promises of God and their promises were made fulfilled right there. And so what, what a reception that must have been as a result of all that. And the Bible describes the end of that reception this way, again in Ephesians chapter, chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. It says, according to the working of his mighty power, this is God, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. So he's taken him up there and he's taken his throne, his original throne, the place he'd always been, the, the, the glory and authority he'd always experienced that he's laid aside for our sakes. He reseats him there in the heavenly places far above, notice, all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He takes his rightful place. He had ascended to take his place as the undisputed Lord. That's one reason. That's a great reason for him to ascend. That's a great reason. So that's what it meant for heaven. That's what it meant for him. That's what it meant for, for God, for his son to return. But it also means so much for us. Let's consider what his ascension meant for us here on earth. First of all, uh, it meant, listen, that his ministry expanded on earth and became far more powerful. So how could it be more powerful? How could it go further? Well, think about his ministry. Where did Jesus work here on earth? Just Palestine. Just the land of Israel. How many converts did he have? effectively very few one of his own 12 betrayed him and they all deserted him right and, and gathered in the upper room with something about 200 people after his uh 
after his uh, resurrection, there just, there just weren't many. Jesus came for another purpose. He didn't come to get a whole bunch of congregants. He didn't come to get a massive movement together. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to die for our sins. He accomplished that. And so the work that he had been doing through his physical body, now he starts doing through his spiritual body, which is us, the church. And so he, we, he, it meant his ministry became expanded. During this three-year earthly ministry, he was limited uh, uh, physically and geographically. But when he regained his glory and his authority and his dimensionality, now he goes wherever we go. Everyone who's accepted Christ as personal Savior, literally you have Jesus living inside you. So where does Jesus go? Everywhere. Jesus is going everywhere. And we need to so recognize that in this time. Everywhere I go, every touch I have, everything that I say can be a ministry for Christ. Can be a time through which he reaches through me. Are you recognizing that? Are you seeing that? So important that we recognize and see that in our lives. So, so he, he seated him above all power and all authority, and, and that's why he tells the disciples, listen, verse, back up to verse 8 in our, in our study here in Acts. Back above it says, you, Jesus told his disciples before he ascended, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, my character witnesses. We're going to talk about that next time. You will be my character witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Not with the sword, not with the sword, but with the word of truth, with the word of forgiveness, with the word of the love of God. And they took over, they literally turned the known world upside down with that message, with the power of that message. That's, that's why he could say also in John 14, verse 12, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than these he will do. Why? Because I go to the Father. It was better, guys, for him to leave than it was for him to stay. I can think of a lot of reasons for him to stay, but they're not as good as a reason for him to leave. And you're seeing the reason right there, so that his work could, could manifest and become much greater through, uh, through the fact that he's in each one of us. And so it meant, first of all, that his, his ministry would expand on earth in both in, in, in size and in power. And the second thing, it meant that we were, even, that we were now going to have an ever faithful and effective prayer partner. Look at what it says in Romans 8, 34. Jesus Christ, who is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is, notice, as, as it told us the previous time at the right hand of God intercedes for us your greatest prayer partner is God's son Jesus your greatest prayer partner he knows what your needs are he's speaking to the father on your behalf it meant we have a ever faithful and effective prayer partner that's the second thing a third thing it meant that we have an advocate first John tells us that little children I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin and if anyone sins and we do, right? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I need an advocate, y'all. I don't know about you, but I need an advocate. I'm so grateful that we have him as our advocate who's standing there. It tells us the same thing, both his, his prayer for us and his advocacy for us in Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able, Jesus is also to save forever to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. See, he's the high priest that's standing next to the Father and interceding for us despite our sins, despite our, our fallenness. He's, he's still rescuing us. He's constantly rescuing us. So he died to rescue us and he lives to rescue us. Such an incredible thing. So it meant we have a prayer partner. We have an advocate. We also get a comforter. Here's the fourth thing. John chapter 16, verse 5 and 7. Now I am going to him, Jesus speaking, who sent me. He's going back. That's his ascension. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. You say, well, I wish Jesus was here. Listen, it's better that he's not. It's far better. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go I will send him to you. How could the helper be better than Jesus? He's far better than Jesus. Far better in his ministry. And the reason why that is, we're going to see in just a second, because of where he is. 
not just who he is, in, in his person, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're exactly the same. I'm not saying in that sense one's better than the other, not at all. But in their ministries, listen, the Holy Spirit is far better. Because he's not like Jesus in which you could touch and you can talk to, and that would be an awesome thing, and we wish he was here for all that. But let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit is far better because he's not just someone you can touch and someone you can talk to. He's someone who lives inside of us. He's the, he's the person of, of the Trinity that lives inside of us. You can't get closer than that. You have it far better, listen, than the disciples had it when Jesus walked the earth on his three-year ministry. You got it far better. They saw both sides. They saw both the side when Jesus was with them, and they saw the side where Jesus has left them, and they would have never gone back to the first because they had the Holy Spirit in them. You never hear one regret that Jesus isn't there, not one time in the book of Acts, not one time in the rest of the New Testament, not one time. Because of what Jesus says here, I send the comforter, I send the helper, I send the counselor, as multiple translations describe, and they're all accurate. I send him to you because I'm able to go to the Father. And so that was a fourth thing. Then a fifth thing, we have God closer to us, we already hinted that, than we have ever, anyone has ever had. Look at what it says here in John. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. That's the one Jesus is sending us. But, but you know him because he abides with you, notice, and will be in you. Like I said before, everywhere we go, we take the spirit of Christ with us. Everywhere we go, Jesus was limited geographically. He could only be in a, one place at one time. Now Jesus is unlimited. Jesus is, was living through a physical body that he gave as a sacrifice for us to pay for our sins, shedding his blood to, to, to wash away our sins. But now he's not living in that physical, or he is living in that physical body, but now he's living through his spiritual body, which is us. Which is us. John 14, 17 makes it clear. And then a final thing, a sixth thing. He's preparing a place for us. Again, John 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Remember, I, I told you this a couple of weeks ago as we entered into this time of, of being uh, this coronavirus, coronavirus, and, and now being um, sheltering in place and living in fear. And Jesus says, don't do that. Don't live in fear. Let not your heart be troubled. The one who came from God to rescue us has gone ahead of us to prepare a place for us. He's taking care of us all the way. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If, I, if it were not so, I would have told you. For I go where up there to prepare a place for you. He's going to prepare for us. He's taking care of us. Why did Jesus ascend? Because he could do far more. Because he could do far more. He could do far more in far more places, through far more people, with far more power, and he could be far closer to us. Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Jesus is right there with you. You don't need him to come down. You don't need him. He can't get any closer than what he is. Do you trust him? Have you placed your faith in him? Placing your faith in Jesus just simply means that, that you, you're always placing your faith in something like, like tomorrow is going to be here. I believe this is going to happen. I believe I'm going to do that. Let's pray, placing your faith in Jesus is just that simple. It means that you believe that he really came, that he really lived, that he really died, that he really resurrected, and that what he did brings salvation to you. He says he able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him who come to God, I'm the way, he says, John, John 12. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I'm sorry, John 14, 6. I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It means, it means placing your faith on a Savior, trusting him. Either, either you're trusting yourself to save yourself. That's what religion teaches us. I have to do these things, I have to follow these rules, I've got to jump through these hoops, and, and then i got to hope at the point I'm passing away that I've done enough. That's you saving yourself. You're your Savior. You're trusting a Savior already. You're trusting yourself. And that's not unless you can't save yourself. Or you trust the Savior that God has sent. His name is Jesus. Place your faith in him that what he did and what he accomplished on the cross and through his resurrection was acceptable to the Father because it is. No one, as he says himself, comes to the Father except through me. Except through me. 
Have you ever accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? I want to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes, and I'll just want you to think about that for just a second. And, and those of you who already know Jesus, just pray for those who may be listening who do not. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to think just this for a second. How, how, how do I come to a Savior? Listen, he spanned heaven and earth. He gave his life for you. He is now ascended, ever ready, listening ready, listening, working through his church. He's working through me to you right now, speaking to you through his word, speaking to you. But it's not me speaking. It's him. It's his spirit speaking to you. That if you'll cry out to him to save you, he'll rescue you. I, as, as, a, as a little boy, I prayed this prayer. I prayed something like this. I said, Jesus, I want you to be my savior. Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I trust you. I, I was raised in a great family where Jesus was the Savior of, of a bunch of us, but he hadn't been my Savior, see. It's not enough to know people that are saved. You have to be saved. Maybe just a simple prayer like that. Believe me, any heartfelt prayer, he hears it. Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to forgive my sins. I want you to be my advocate, my Lord, my Master. Send your Holy Spirit to me. Lord Jesus, I know that you're doing that. I know that you live forever to do that, staying at the right hand of the Father, working through the church, just like you're working through me right now, working through the body of Christ, wherever you find, wherever we're found, living in us. Lord, help us to recognize that you've created us for such a time as this. You're given us wisdom to know to, how to be the people for such a time as this. Thank you for speaking to us today, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptist.org.